This lecture is part of an online mathematics course on group theory and will be about the Jordan Holder theorem. So um, if we've got a group G, we can break it up into simple groups as follows. So we can find a chain of subgroups. One is equal to G naught contained in G1 up to contained in Gn. Um, by the way, I should say I'm considering all groups to be finite in this lecture, such that Gi is normal in Gi plus 1, and Gi plus 1 over Gi is simple, meaning it's got no normal subgroups other than the whole group in itself. And this is quite easy because if G is simple, we're done. If it doesn't, we pick a normal subgroup to be one of these groups, Gi, and then we just sort of continue applying this to the normal subgroup and the quotient by the normal subgroup. So this is called a composition series. And we can give some examples of composition series. So from the previous lecture, we studied several groups of order 120, and these have composition series as follows. First of all, if we take the binary icosahedral group, then it has a composition series that looks like this. And the composition factors, which mean these quotients, well, this factor is obviously a group of order two, and this group is the group of rotations of an icosahedron or the equivalent of the group A5. Another group was the symmetric group S5, and this has a composition series which looks like this. So this time, this quotient is the group A5, and this quotient is order two. So you see we have two groups with two composition series, and each composition series has a group of order two and the group of order A5, only they're put together in different ways. We can have some more like this. For instance, we can take the group Z modulo 2Z, and this is contained in A5 times Z modulo 2Z, or we can take one contained in A5 contained in A5 times Z modulo 2Z. And again, this quotient here is order two, and this is A5, and this quotient here is A5, and this quotient here is order two. So we see that the composition factors don't determine the group. Here we've got two and A5 as composition factors, and here we've got two as A5. And the group doesn't determine the order of the composition factors because in this group, we can first do two, then A5, or do them in the other order. For these two, the order is fixed. So there's a, there's a lot of variation in what composition series can look like. Um, by the way, I should, should point out that each GI is normal in the next one. This doesn't imply that G1, say, is normal in GN. For instance, if we look at one contained in Z over 2Z, contained in z over 2z squared, which is contained in the tetrahedral group A4, then each of these subgroups is normal in the next one, but z modulo 2z is not normal in, in A4. It's an example of something called a subnormal subgroup. If you've got a chain of subgroups such that each is normal in the next, then we say that the one at the bottom is subnormal in the top. Um, so, um, so there's a lot of variation in the composition series. However, you see in this composition series, although the 2 and the A5 occur in a different order, they each both occur once. And this is, illustrates the Jordan-Holder theorem. Um, so these were two 19th century group theorists, which says that any two composition series... of a group G um, have the same number of each simple factor. And um, we're going to prove this theorem by sort of driving a taxi cab around in a in a rectangular array. So the idea is as follows. Suppose you've got two composition series. So one is equal to A naught contains in, contains in A, M contains in G equals G. 
with ai plus one over ai simple. And we take one is equal to b naught contained in b1 contained in bn equals g with each of the bi plus one over bi simple. And we want to show that these quotients are the same as these quotients, possibly in a different order. So what we do is we form this big array. We take AM intersection BN, which is just equal to G. And then we have AM intersection BN minus 1. We go all the way down to AM intersect B naught. And then we have A naught intersect B naught here. This is just one, of course, and this is just the whole group G. And then we have A naught, so A1 intersect B naught and so on. So, so we have this sort of two-dimensional array of groups. Uh, where have I got to this? Should be A naught intersect B n. And um, we notice that each of these groups is a normal subgroup of the two groups above, above it. So what we have is this sort of two-dimensional array of groups as a sort of you can think of this as a rather unimaginatively planned town where each of these vertices is some group and each of these lines is a quotient um, which is um, so, so, which is a quotient of two groups and each quotient is either a simple group or or one so so a line is simple or one. So it's so it's quite common for, for these two groups here to be the same. For example, in this diagram here, all these groups on the left-hand column are the trivial group, so they're all the same as each other. And we can imagine a taxi cab wandering through this town, and the taxi cab is going to go from the this corner to this corner. So for instance, it could go along there. And as the taxi cab goes along, we look at the different quotients it passes through. So this taxi cab is going to pass through 1, 1, 1, 1, and then it's going to pass through these quotients, B1 over B0, B2 over B1, and so on. Um, so this taxi cab route gives us the second composition series. On the other hand, we could also drive like this, and this would give us um, quotients 1, 1, 1, 1, and then we would get A1 over A0 and so on. And we can have other routes. For instance, the taxi cab could do something like this. And we would again get some other quotients um, along this route. And what we want to do is to show that every taxi cab route has the same quotients, possibly in a different order. And that would be enough to show that um, these two composition series have the same factors. So how can we do this? Well, you notice that we can get from any taxi cab route to another one just by um, repeatedly flipping it on some squares. So if we look at something like this, we can have two taxi cab routes. So it might come along like this and go like that. And we might have another one which goes like this. So it's just the same, except we've changed this square here. And obviously, by repeating this operation, we can get from any taxi cab route to any other taxi cab route. We're assuming the taxi cab driver is honest and goes by the, the shortest route and doesn't start going around in circles or something, which wouldn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, so let's look at what happens here. Well, um, what we're getting is a group A, I intersect B, J, A, I minus one intersect B J, A I intersect B J minus one, 
and a i minus one intersect b j minus one. And we may as well quotient out by this group here since it's a normal subgroup of everything. So what we have is, 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 is a group X and certain subgroups A and B, which intersect in the identity. So we've got a particularly simple arrangement. And as, as before, each of these quotients is either simple or is the identity. And now let's look at what happens. Well, if A equals B, then we can look at what the quotients are. Well, the quotients here are just A, and the quotients here are just X over A. So what happens if we go by these two different routes? Well, if we go this way, we get X and X over A. And if we go this way, we again get A and X over A. So the factors we get don't change. What happens if A is not equal to B? Well, A and B are simple normal subgroups of X, from which it follows easily that X must actually be equal to A times B. And what we're getting now is this quotient is A, this quotient is B, this quotient is B, and this quotient is A. So if we look at these two routes, see this route we do A followed by B, and this route we do B followed by A. So every time we change the taxi cab route, we either keep the order of two factors the same or we switch them. So, so any two taxi cab routes have the same factors. Uh, in a possibly different order. So this proves the Jordan-Holder theorem. Which says that the number of times any given simple group occurs in a composition series doesn't depend on the composition series. So, um, by the way, this also works for groups with operators. That means it works for groups with some extra automorphisms on the groups. And the main example of this is modules over a ring. So we can think of a module over a ring as being a group with various operators. So what this says is if you've got a module over a ring, it can be broken up into simple modules and the number of times each simple module occurs is independent of how you break it up. Um, so um, this kind of in some ways reduces the study of groups to the study of simple groups. Well, not entirely, because as we've seen, if, if you've got various simple groups, there can be many ways to stick them together into a group. But some problems can be reduced to the problem of um, solving simple groups. So now we want to know how do we classify simple groups? Well, the simple finite groups have been classified. There are 18 infinite series. And two typical examples of this are the groups, alternating groups A, N for N greater than or equal to five, and the um, projective special linear groups, N over FQ. This is provided N is greater than or equal to two, and N is greater than or equal to three if Q is two or three, and various other series. And then there are 26 sporadic groups which don't fit into this classification. So the smallest is M11, which has about 7920 elements, and the biggest is the monster, which has about 10 to the 54 elements. Um, the proof of this is maybe the most difficult published proof in mathematics. There are various computer proofs which are a good deal longer where a computer checks a gazillion different cases, but as far as 
journal pages is concerned, the classification of um, simple groups is the most difficult and longest theorem. How long it is, nobody really knows. I've seen estimates of about 10,000 pages um, or 20,000 or something. The, the trouble is this proof is scattered around so many journal pages that nobody really knows quite how long it is. If you want to see a summary of it, there's a nice summary of it in these three books. There's a book by David Gorenstein, The Finite Simple Groups, An Introduction to Their Classification. And then he had um, a um, follow-up. He was going to publish three volumes on this. So he had classification for non-characteristic two type. Um, unfortunately, he died before he could finish this, but Ashbacher, Lee, and Smith, and Solomon um, finished it for him and did the ones of characteristic two type. So these three volumes total more than a thousand pages, and they basically just give a summary of the proof without giving the detailed proof. So that the proof itself is, um, I think there are very, very few people who know most of it. Um, so how does the proof work? Well, you can't really summarize a 10,000 page proof in a sentence, but I'm going to try anyway. It works by looking at the centralizers of an involution. So this is the key theme in, in the whole proof. So you remember an involution is an element of order two. And a centralizer is just a subgroup of things that commute with it. And Brouwer pointed out that if you know the centralizer of an involution of a simple group, then you can determine it up to a finite number of possibilities. So very roughly, the idea of this proof is you pin down the possible structure of the centralizer of an involution of a simple group. And then given the centralizer of an involution, you try and identify the group. In order for this to work, a group actually has to have an involution. Um, if it doesn't, then you can't really pin it down by looking at its the centralizer. And a group has an involution if and only if it is even order. So the very first step in the proof is to show that any simple group has even order. And this is by itself one of the most difficult theorems in mathematics. It was originally proved by Feit and Thompson in this rather famous paper, Solvability of Groups of Odd Order. So um, if, if a group of odd order is solvable, then it can't be simple. So this shows that every simple group has an involution. And this single paper is, it's about 250 pages long, and it's incredibly difficult to read in parts. So here's a typical page of it. You can see it contains all these rather complicated generation relation calculations. Um, I've no idea what's going on here. Um, I've tried reading parts of this, and my experience is it takes me a good hour to understand each page of this paper. So it would take 300 hours of hard work to understand the proof completely. Um, OK, that's all I want to say about simple groups for the moment. So the next lecture, we'll be studying outer automorphisms, or more precisely, the outer automorphisms of the symmetric group. S6.